Um, thanks for joining us early. We're going <coughs> to uh, talk about early to late stage startup funding trends. And I'm going to let each of the uh, speakers introduce themselves, starting with Esther. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Esther Barak, and I'm from Israel. I'm managing the uh, Nielsen Innovate Fund. It's an early stage fund and also an incubator, which is backed by OCS. Um, I'll talk about it later. Good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm Bonnie Kian, and I'm with the NYSE. I focus primarily uh, and work with um, enterprise technology companies that are thinking about going public at some point in the US. And um, lately, uh, you know, there's obviously been a little bit of a slowdown, but happy to talk about that uh, in a minute. I'm John Medved. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Our Crowd. We're probably the largest uh, equity crowdfunding platform in the world, or one of the two. We're competing, obviously, with AngelList. And uh, good to be here. Great. And I'm Curtis Mo. I'm a corporate and securities partner. Uh, lawyer in Palo Alto. I do a lot of work in San Francisco nowadays and worked with over, well over a thousand companies from all over the world. Uh, of course, there are a lot of companies that we mine in our backyard here. And the typical pathway is <coughs> to, in the U.S. is to form a Delaware corporation. Uh, Delaware is a tiny state that has focused all its rev revenue generation on uh, taxing corporations. And, you know, these companies often wind up in incubators, and they get some basic funding if they have wearable connected devices or hardware. Maybe they do some kind of Kickstarter crowdsourcing campaign, do some pre-sales of their product to get going. Uh, they eventually raise some angel or seed or institutional seed capital, typically million, million and a half, sometimes less in uh, convertible notes in the U.S. because they can't really price these rounds, um, and that's the general pathway, I would say, for two standard deviations of the successful companies around here. Esther, can you give us a picture of how companies in Israel form and grow? Okay. Um, and, raise, and how they raise their seed financing. So there are uh, several uh, uh, ways to raise seed money. Uh, like in the States, there's all, uh, there also in Israel, there's the accelerators. Usually, people go there for a short period of time, three months, and they either just get space to work in, or they get also a very small amount of money to, uh, as an investment, like up to $100,000. Then we have the incubators. The, the uh, incubators are as not as in the States. It's backed by the government. Uh, you have to have a license in order to manage an, an incubator. Uh, the license is for eight years. Uh, during that period, you are committed to invest in companies. Uh, there are some rules, so you have to take uh, equity, but you have there's a minimum and maximum amount of equity you can take in each company, and you are for each dollar that you invest, the government will invest five dollars to begin with. And later on, if you continue investing in the company, so for each dollar you invest, the government will back you with an additional dollar doesn't take any equity, the government. They only uh, provide it as a loan that you have to return only if you have uh, an exit or if you have uh, royalties from income, 3% from, uh, from the revenues. So it's a very nice program. Uh, I think um, that I was the first one to bring into Israel uh, corporate from the States, it used, it used to be owned by Israelis only, but now all the international uh, corporates starting to come to Israel and to be interested in owning um, incubators. So uh, I partnered with Nielsen, that was the first one. Going further from incubators, so there are other, of course, angels investors um, that, by the way, invest also side by side with us, but uh, also, seed investments, they are very important for all the very early stage companies. And uh, then the VCs. Uh, and, and these are all Israeli based or are they uh, US well, and European investors also? Uh, we can invest, with, uh, well, my investors, my Nielsen Innovate Fund investors are not Israeli based. Only one of them is Israeli based. So 80% is US based. Nielsen Corporate is one of them, but also other investors. Uh, the other uh, incubators are 
it's a combination of Israeli and international. And we are also allowed to invest with any international company. Just a little basic data so people get a sense of what's going on in Israel. I know there are a lot of Israelis. How many Israelis, how many non-Israelis in the audience? Raise your hands. Okay, good. So um, the bottom line is that the business environment for startup funding is on fire in Israel. Um, in fact, if you look back just two years, in 2013, there was $2.2 billion invested in Israeli uh, venture-backed startups. 2014, last year, when we fought a war, that went up to 3.4 billion, or you know, a growth of over 40 percent. This year, it's going to be five billion dollars. The data in from the first of October was 4.2 billion. So we have more than doubled the amount of venture capital investment in the country in simply two years. Now that is an extraordinary growth. I don't know if we can double again the next two years. That would be really cool to get to $10 billion of investment in the Israeli ecosystem. We're talking about 5,000 startups. About 800 of them will get this kind of venture funding this year. There are 200 incubators and accelerators in the country, just to give you, you know, a sense of the, of the size. And in terms of companies traded, I'm sure you'll talk about it here in New York, we represent the fourth largest combined delegation after Canada and China, and of course the US. Um, so the scene is insane at the moment. It's really, I mean, as it is here, it's, it's, it's the best of times um, in many ways. And the international players who are coming into the market um, are, are, are quite extraordinary. And right now, 350 different multinationals now have R&D centers in Israel, boots on the ground, and that seems to be increasing with you know, huge new players like Apple and uh, Amazon who were not playing significantly now coming into the market. So uh, on, that, on that sense, it's great. I'd love to talk later about how the whole thing is going to get disrupted, because it is. It's in the, we're in the process of major disruption in the funding of uh, uh, companies most people haven't actually sort of noticed it yet. Um, Esther, uh, you're with a unique group because Nielsen's sponsoring an incubator. And in the US, we've got a lot of corporate sponsors of incubators. But there are also a lot of corporate investors. I'd say, I don't have the stats with me, but corporate VC in the United States is probably the fastest growing uh, um, segment right now. Um, are these companies, John and Esther, are they doing investments in Israel? So for Nielsen, this is the first uh, venture capital that they're running. Uh, now they have also another fund that they are running of a round, also in Israel and the United States. Uh, this uh, initiative uh, is uh, Nielsen Innovate uh, is interesting because we are investing in companies that are Nielsen related. We don't. We're not looking all only for companies that are in the area of the business of Nielsen. Nielsen is doing the. Uh, you know they are collecting data in two sectors of the buy, what people buy and what people see, which is quite, and, you know, they have, uh, um, uh, they're in 100 countries, they have 40,000, uh, I mean, no, 20,000 customers. So my, um, the, the idea is to look for companies that can uh, gain uh, help from Nielsen either from their business, from their technology, to check the, the product, or with door opening. Because I think we can talk about it also, that the one problem that Israeli startups have is that the go-to-market, the reach to the customers, the, the we are located, the, at least in the beginning, they are in Israel, before they move to the Silicon Valley or anywhere else. And the, the, um, the reach to their customers, to the market, to Foreign investors, it's very difficult. Uh, this is where we come and try to help them. Uh, in, with Nielsen Innovate, we do it with uh, all the, uh, Nielsen's customers. So. Yeah, and we'll come back to that. But I think this is an important point. Here in the US, uh, the traditional corporate investors have been technology companies like Cisco or Google Ventures. Nowadays, you're as likely to see Mercedes-Benz or Ford Motor Company worried about autonomous driving that will disrupt their market, or Coca-Cola worried about you know, how to market their beverages. Um, Hospital Corporation of America, HCA, 
worried about how to provide healthcare services in a very expensive operating environment. So we, we see it all. And you're starting to see companies as far flung as Mercedes Benz to, uh, to the film industry um, setting up shop here. Um, John, in, in the US, the, there, there are different types of online fundraising. There's, and there's a lot of confusion, of course. So there are the Kickstarter Indiegogo pre-sale campaigns. And those companies are just raising money to buy a product or a service. And maybe the product or service arrives, maybe it doesn't. But they're not selling ownership or um, borrowing money, really. It's, it's a donation, and maybe you get a freebie in return. Then there's the angel list of the world and the kind of private placements, the companies that raise private capital from high net worth individuals. Uh, and then there's, of course, the Jobs Act and the other SEC initiatives, which really have not taken off because of limitations. Jobs Act, people don't realize Jobs Act crowdfunding is limited to a million dollars per company, which is hardly worth the effort when you think about the audited financials. Um, but so therefore, it's really been a early stage seed funding exercise in the United States. What's, how, how do you see that changing, or is it different in Israel? It's, well, certainly different by us. Um, look, Kickstarter and Indiegogo are wonderful. If you're making a gadget or some kind of cool little consumer product and you can go get non-dilutive funding, i.e., people will give you millions of dollars and you don't give them one share of stock, I'm in, okay? I mean, how, how much better and cool is that? The problem is that half of the time these people don't ship the product, and the, and the biggest problem is that when you back a company that actually becomes successful, like Palmer Lucky's uh, Oculus, and uh, literally I was speaking two days ago in San Diego and I asked the audience, had anyone backed Oculus Rift? Does anyone here a backer of Oculus? on their um, Kickstarter campaign. So I asked the guy, I said, how do you feel? And he said, I, I sent uh, $60 and I got the t-shirt. And I said, how do you feel though? You know, Palmer became a billionaire. He sold the company uh, for $2 billion to Facebook. He said, really? I feel like a schmuck, okay? <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, the guy didn't send him a ticket to go party in Maui or even an iTunes, you know, uh, gift card. You get nothing, you get a lousy t-shirt, okay? and and. So they've done a, a great favor for the people like, like ourselves and others who are at our crowd who are doing uh, equity crowdfunding because we don't give you t-shirts. We give you essentially stock in the upside. So if Mr. Lucky gets seriously lucky, you're gonna get at least a little lucky. And um, the bottom line is that they're different platforms. So AngelList focuses, for example, on, on angels and you follow angels. They have a uh, you know, very, very simple business model. They take a 5% carry only Okay, and then uh, you're in the angel's hands. The angel typically doesn't sit on the board. You're often getting uh, uh, common stock, and away you go. They just got a $400 million check from a big Chinese fund, which is showing that this whole area is, is, is very serious. But the second kind of crowdfunding is what we're doing, which is we're funding companies from those early stages together with angels, but we're curating the stuff. We don't rely on anybody else. We're actually doing the deal selection. We have Ronnie Ross here from uh, Panorama, whose uh, company's right now up on the site. Okay, so we selected this company. This is not an angel deal, right? This is a company with, uh, and I can talk about this legally today because of uh, uh, the new, some of the Jobs Act stuff, which has actually come aboard, which is public solicitation. I could put your company up on a billboard if I wanted to on 101. We're not going to do it. But the bottom line is this is a company with over $4 million of revenue, backed by people like Intel and others. And we're giving you know, individual investors a chance to invest in that from $10,000 up. We just did a deal okay, with a very big, important industrial Internet of Things company um, that comes from the military background in Israel. The company had $25 million of revenue, $7 million of EBITDA, and we were leading a $25 million round on a crowdfunding platform. So we're doing from $200,000 or $300,000 up to $25 million rounds. We're co-investing with Andreessen, with Excel, with Bessemer, Battery, several deals with Vinod Kosla, deals here with Microsoft, General Electric, um, 3M, you name it. So this is changing big time because the platforms like ours and others, there's another really cool group in Israel called iAngels, which are two unbelievably 
talented women who are fought doing sort of an angel list model. And, and the bottom line is this is going to change, in my opinion, many things. Because what's happening in the private market is that there's a huge food fight beginning and going to get much worse. Everybody who's got half a brain wants to invest in private companies. And the answer is very simple. There is no more frickin' alpha, okay, in the public market. You can't buy a public stock the way you used to, okay, and actually make real money. It's gone. Forget about it. Talk to your RIA, figure out what's going on, because in the old days, you could have bought this company here, Microsoft, when it went public, and you would have made 600 times your money. You could have bought Apple Computer and made 300 times your money in the public market. Oracle, 700 times your money. Today, let's say you made a really great pick. Best recent IPO of a big public company, Facebook. How much money have you made since the IPO? Have you bought it on the first day of trading? About three times your money. And that's as good as it's getting. You're not getting 10x and 20x and 30x in the public market anymore. It's not there. It's gone because Uber and Airbnb and Dropbox and everybody else has sucked it out as a private company. So now you've got every major private equity fund. John, these aren't your investors. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying that the, the bottom line is there's a, that what's happening is that people are going to be stepping over themselves to get into the private market. So people think that the funding of innovation, innovative companies is going to sort of slow or taper or stay the same, it's going to totally change. Right. I'm kidding you, but I just wanted to slow you down a little. And, and let's, let, let's, Impossible. Uh, <laughs> let's take a step back on, you know, the SEC has been slowly balancing investor protection against um, liberalizing and modernizing the securities regulation in the U.S. Securities regulation in the U.S. is, um, you know, kind of our own best friend and our own worst enemy. It's the best friend because it, it is the safest securities market in the world, and, and time has borne that out. The London markets um, have done great in recent years, but I think it's clear that the New York's markets um, um, have, have maintained their kind of leadership. And Bonnie, I'd be very interested in your views on, uh, you know, the different markets uh, and where Israeli companies are looking to list down the road. Sure. So, um, so in kind of looking backwards over the last couple of years, obviously uh, the U.S. is the place where many companies go that are not domiciled in the U.S. In fact, we actually, um, I would say, the NYSE lists ninety percent of the market value of all non-domiciled -dom um, companies. Israel, specifically, the country, when you look at companies that want to go outside for um, the public market access, and there's a bunch of reasons why they pick the U.S., but effectively about 75% of those companies end up being listed here in the U.S., a combination of because you've got greater access to liquidity, deals are larger, you've got transparency, you've also got um, actually the Jobs Act that benefit to a certain extent of companies coming here, listing because there is an ability to keep all of that under the cover until you're within 30 days of that roadshow and you flip the switch. So that way, any of that sensitive information that's in your filings would be kept confidential until you're ready to kind of go out to the market, depending on what the bankers tell you. So all in all, and in technology specifically, I would say that um, going along the lines of, you know, there we've changed our standards at the NYSE over the last couple of years. And I would say five years ago, many of the companies um, in technology, because they're growth oriented, because they're VC backed, would easily, easily select kind of the other exchange. But now that we've kind of simplified the standards where it's only a minimum of $200 million market cap to get onto the big board, we also have another smaller MKT exchange where we do have some, uh, you know, some of the smaller um, sub $200 million market cap companies go out, that has made it easier for companies to list with us. Um, the, and in technology, specifically on Israeli companies, there hasn't been that many exits on the IPO market. The one last year that everybody's obviously heard of was Mobileye, which was a pretty successful IPO. So. And how about vis-a-vis -vis the London markets? Yeah, London, you know, there's not that many companies that list um, from Israel onto the London Stock Exchange. I think there was maybe one big one last year. But again, um, I think there's obviously, as, as you guys are all here as well, there's much more of a tie-in, I think, from a customer perspective. And that's why many companies end up choosing to list in the U.S. And, and how about the secondary markets, right? There's the London A market. 
there's the Toronto SOC, the TSX in Toronto, mm -hmm. and then there are all sorts of secondary markets in Asia. How about those markets for Israeli companies? Very, very few. I mean, I, I you know, I think London AIM definitely, but beyond that, I don't think when I looked at the, um, looking backwards, there weren't any real companies that listed in the Asian markets per se um, at all. So, and just to kind of give a broader perspective, the U.S. lists 2x the number of companies of the next exchange outside of the U.S. and three times the amount of capital gets, um, you know, uh, is made within the U.S. So again, the U.S. by far kind of outnumbers um, a lot of the other um, secondary markets. Right. And on the private capital raising front, one thing that John touched on is, uh, it's a little technical, but it's the uh, 506C rules. And previously, you could only sell, uh, short of listing, uh, registering the SEC as an IPO, you had to do a private placement, and the most common exemption from registration people use was Regulation D. Reg D, you hear Reg D all the time. Part of that was that you had to sell to institutional or individual accredited investors. $5 million institutions, uh, individuals who are millionaires net of their home mortgage value, or who have $200,000 in annual individual income or $300,000 a year in household income. They've liberalized that and said, you can go out to anybody you want, post on a billboard, go on internet websites, um, go door to door all you want. But then when you make the sale, you can only sell to accredited, verified accredited investors. And it requires you to get some snoopy information like tax returns or lawyer's letters or financial statements to prove that pre people are millionaires. So that's the kind of catch-22 because a lot of pe the uh, kind of state investment banks don't want to go and do that with their customers. John, how, how do you see that and all the kind of have, – has, have, has U.S. securities regulation liberalized enough or do you see areas that they – really are behind the times it's, on it. It's still dynamic. I mean, for example, in the UK, you don't have to be an accredited investor to invest in equity crowdfunding at the moment. Um, the regulations for accredited investors, for example, vary in country to country. So uh, in Israel, it's much more stringent. In Israel, you have to have 8 million shekels to be uh, what's called a, a mashkia kashio, which means a kosher, uh, literally, uh, investor. Um, and that's obviously about $2 million of uh, assets. Um, so it, it varies from place to place. The, the, the bottom line is that non-accredited, broad-based equity crowdfunding is coming. The Jobs Act stuff has been stuck for four years with the SEC. And I, and I don't fault them because it's really hard to figure out how you're going to open this up to non-accredited people, let everybody put in a couple hundred dollars, Okay, and not get cheated, you know, by uh, bad actors and, and whatnot. And this is complicated. Um, we're not focused there. It turns out that the accredited investor opportunity in the U.S. there are 10 million accredited households, 10 million, and according to the National Angel Association, something between 100,000 and 200,000 of them have ever made an angel investment. So you're talking about 98 percent plus of these wealthy people, these millionaires, have never invested in this <coughs> asset class. And that's bad. It's bad for the asset class. It's bad for them. But the good news is you've got this huge unlocked sense of capital which is looking to come into venture capital. In other words, the reason that these valuations are what they are here in the Valley and the there's so many unicorns is because people want into being a private investor. And these companies don't need to go public anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, I, I, my, my last company, full disclosure, I took on NYSE, okay, uh, because they were really nice to work with. Um, but bottom line is who needs to go public today, right? Everyone used to dream. You sit there as an, an entrepreneur, you're dreaming of going public. When you can raise money at $50 billion private, you know, market value and still get liquidity, right? Because of the Jobs Act, these guys are selling shares on secondary shares. It's, it's a real question. And um, I think there's lots of other reasons to go public. Maybe you know, we can hear about some of them. But um, I, I think that this is changing, and you're going to see a, a, a huge shift of these broad-based platforms joining the corporates, joining venture capital, joining traditional angels. And it's just in its very early days. John makes a really good point. Um, was lost in all the Jobs Act and on the Internet f uh, crowdfunding debates are that there are tons of accredited investors and 
high net worth individuals, there's a huge growth of incubators, accelerators, seed institutional seed, corporate seed, VC seed funds. Uh, Santa Clara County alone has over 250,000 millionaires. There's a new millionaire created in this county every seven minutes. Um, <laughs> The, 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 there's something like five of the most expensive zip code towns for residential real estate in the United States, and, and, and that's in comparison to places like Beverly Hills and Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan. So there's plenty of capital. I mean, one thing you should take away from this is that there, there's more and more early stage funding sources here and in Israel than ever before. It's actually quite remarkable, and I think part of that is because of the lean startup era. You really have uh, SaaS on-demand delivery, cloud services. You don't have to buy servers. You can store. You can securely store online. Uh, you've got cl uh, open source tools. It's very cheap to do a startup nowadays. And I think that's why the incubators and accelerators and co-working spaces are so popular. Who wants to work in their bedroom or in their garage, right? You want to work around other people and you know, find co-founders co and, and kind of marinate your company. So I've heard three really good reasons that Israeli companies will eventually wind up in the U.S. market. Not everybody, but Esther mentioned the markets. Bonnie talked about listing and the dominance of the New York exchanges. And then John, of course, talked about all the different ways of raising capital and maybe having M&A exits. When do companies, when do companies think of coming to the U.S. and in what capacity and what companies just stay Israel-centric? Um, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I think that um, most of the companies will need to move to the out of Israel at a certain point, at least the uh, marketing and sales uh, and management. No need for the R&D to move. The R&D can stay in Israel. But uh, definitely, Israel is 8 million uh, people. The population is only 8 million. So they are not uh, building a company in order to be selling in Israel. And I must tell you, it's very difficult to sell from Israel uh, to the States or to China or to Japan or anywhere else in Asia. So it's really, um, they have to move. They have to move. So. Uh, most of the Israelis will start a company, and from my perspective, after a year, they have to go out of Israel, at least uh, un either to hire people out of Israel or to, to relocate in order to succeed, because you, you, you don't wait until you finish developing your product if, uh, when you contact your first customer. John, what, what, what kind of company do you think is the ideal candidate to um, set up in the U.S. or, or move here? Well, here or, or elsewhere, I mean, every Israeli company needs to move somewhere, okay? And doesn't have to move the headquarters. But as Esther said, there, you know, there's no market. I mean, you know, there's, it's just, and, and that's, you know, you can view that as a curse. I view it as a blessing. Because what happens is the Israeli companies go global from day one. Put your butt on an airplane and you just get out there. So, for example, uh, comparative data point. This year, Australia is going to have a really good year of venture capital in Australia. 200 million bucks invested. Israel is going to invest 25 times that, 500, five, $5 billion versus Australia's you know, 200. Australia is no slouch. And they have three times our population. Their problem is that they're entrepreneurs and they get started. Think about being the kings of Australia. That's big enough. Same in Brazil. But what's, what's happening, though, is there's a shift, I think, which we're not entirely aware of here in the Valley, which is that Israeli companies are now no longer just Valley obsessed. They're thinking much more, and I think intelligently, about Asia. Um, instead of turning left always out of Israel, we're turning right. And there's uh, a huge influx of Asian capital of all kinds, primarily Chinese capital, but also coming from Japan, from India, from uh, Korea. Samsung alone made eight investments as a corporate VC last year in Israel. Um, so th there's, th I think, a very important change that way. And I think that one of the things you're going to see going forward is that finally the world's going to get a little more flatter relative to innovation and innovation finance. If you're not in the Valley today, you know, you're, you're, you're not in the Mecca or the ground zero 
but it's worse than that because if you're somewhere else, like I, we have a company we've invested and in, just announced a really great round with HPC called Surgical Theater who do neuro uh, simulation and they got money uh, and they're based in Cleveland. And the story they tell is that they would, uh, a year or two years ago before we got involved, they would call investors in the Valley or in the East Coast. They'd say, we've got this great technology. People get excited and they say, where are you? And they'd say Cleveland and the call would last typically about five minutes longer before you know they hung up and they never heard again from the investor because they weren't itching to go to Cleveland to put money in. But it turns out that there's innovation in Cleveland and Cincinnati and Columbus and everywhere else. And that's finally, I think, going to get its proper attention. I think that's right. I mean, the world is flatter. Um, for those of you who don't know our firm, DLA Piper, we are the largest law firm in the world. We've got 4,000 lawyers in 77 offices, 31 countries, every continent. Our firm is, in fact, a bet that the world is going to be flat over time. But and, and I have no regional bias. I'm, I'm from the East Coast. My parents are Chinese immigrants. Uh, but uh, I do think that Northern California is kind of like Hollywood. It's a dominant region for the tech sector because the infrastructure is so extreme. The uh, connectivity, and it's, it, when you think about Hollywood, you can have all sorts of movie regions and studios, but it's really hard to replicate a place that has all those folks at the end of the movie when they scroll the credits there. <laughs> And, and the, the amount of financing and the amount of infrastructure and the players. Um, so that's how I kind of think of it in the near term. Um, why don't we talk about, in the time that we have left, why don't we talk about the kind of big pink elephant in the financing world nowadays. Storm clouds are gathering. You know, winter is coming. Um, we've experienced a really long bull market, but we've er, had the tech bubble burst in the early part of the last decade. We had the mortgage crisis in 07, 08, and now we've got all sorts of rumblings in the Middle East and Europe and the United States, and we're, of course, we're in election year. So all I hear about now is, wow, there's a bubble. Um, what's, what's your perspectives on that? Well, I, I hope And then not. I'll share mine. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure. I mean, everybody's talking about 2016 as the next uh, crash. Uh, I, I hope it's wrong. I hope it's only like, you know, every eight years there's a development in a relationship in the family. That's what uh, is, uh, the theory is said. So also in high tech, like every eight years something happens. So the last one was 2008. 2008. But I, I really think that something is changing and uh, is developing. And I, I hope and I, I believe there won't be uh, another crash like in 2008, but definitely there is uh, what people call a bubble, but maybe it's a development, interesting development. Yeah, Bonnie, may, why don't you give us an insight into the IPO market and how that's affecting the tech industry? I don't really, I see the IPO market as being vibrant for the big companies, but not a volume exercise like it was in 99. Sure, um, and, and maybe what I'll do is really reference kind of the last five years just to give context. So post-financial um, crisis, when the IPO market started to come back in kind of 2010 or so, between 2010 and 2013, the median market cap of public companies going out on listing day was about six to seven hundred million. In 2014 and 2015 year to date, those have been way above the billion dollar mark on a median cap basis. So to John's point, there's companies that have delayed their exit or have also been able to get um, capital raises in the late stage, uh, you know, that basically defers that. And then when they do go out, they're a little bit bigger um, in size. Having said that, year over year, IPOs and technology have dropped significantly and there's de in terms of number of deals and definitely um, in terms of <coughs> pace and there's definitely a pause going on ever since kind of mid-August. I mean, NYC still lists over 60% of technology companies, so we do have a pretty big pulse, but as, um, as Curtis mentioned, really right now what we're seeing is you know, in kind of second half of this year, it's really only the large companies that have gone out. So Pure Storage, for example, just listed on the NYSC um, a couple of weeks ago, and they basically listed, uh, priced within the range, but traded down a little bit on, on their IPO day, which is not really ideal for investors um, that are coming in in, term in terms of the public side. Um, 
Box was another one that was a big um, listing um, on our exchange uh, earlier this year. And again, their valuation at the time of um, the public exit was basically a slightly actually below their last round when you think about all the different triggers and stuff. So again, not ideal. And I think right now the companies that are really trying to get out are the ones that need to get out from a liquidity or financing perspective. And if, you know, I know I, s I speak for the <laughs> NYSE, but if you know if I uh, if I was in your shoe, if you can have access to that capital either at the beginning or at the later stage, and there's definitely still ab abundance of that, I would delay that until you're really ready, and so you have a better story to tell, and so you can have that you know more greater appeal to those public investors. Yeah. By the way, before John weighs in, I, I I'd be remiss not to congratulate the exchange on today's debut of Ferrari. Yeah, that was a that was a fun one. If you guys didn't get a chance, you can go on to CNBC and look at the opening bell. But that that's a fantastic, uh, fun uh, IPO. I think when you look at this question of whether there's a bubble or not, it really depends on your on your time frame of reference. Because if you're looking over a year or two or three, sure there could be and there probably will be, you know, significant corrections in prices, and that's um, not a bad thing. Okay, I mean that means that buying gets to be better. Yeah, you know, if it depends if you're a seller or a buyer, um, but there's, I think, going to be more rational valuations for investors, you know, uh, coming soon. Um, but if you look at it th over a 10 or 20 year time frame, which is really often the way that venture capitalists look at things, you know, or, or, or people who are trying to build a real portfolio for growth, there's no question that the trend line is up and to the right big time. We are at the beginning of huge secular trends that we haven't even begun to understand how much change is going to be driven by them. And whether it's this Internet of Things, which you know some people think is overhyped, I think it's underhyped. Okay, and I think that it, it's not just a consumer thing; it's an industrial thing. You know, the amount of data that's uh, that's going to throw off, in addition to the amounts of uh, you know uh, data obesity that we already have. Okay, there are going to be tons of opportunities in terms of, you know, big data and personalization and, you know, social everything and on-demand everything. We're talking about trends that simply are not going to stop, right? People are not going to, uh, when, you, when you think about like Uber, and Uber is a very controversial company, um, especially re relative to its valuation, but you figure out that this industry has now disrupted the yellow cab Okay, I mean, what? Who's who's next? And who, I'll tell you who's next. Who's next is every regulated industry. Okay, in other words, until now, innovation <coughs> has destroyed or disrupted, you know, traditional industries um, that were not regulated. But the next wave is going to be everything regulated. Think electricity, utilities. Think education. Think healthcare. Okay, think, and and that's going to be tougher. You know, infrastructure. Transportation, I mean, you know, we haven't really got started with transportation at all. Also fintech okay. and loans. Fintech and, and legal stuff. And that, and I think that's where there is huge opportunity, and I don't see this stopping anytime soon. I, I think that's probably right. Um, you know, if you think about the Internet 10 years ago, it was a much different Internet. Um, there were very few mobile apps. The sense was it was middleware. The Hand carrier, uh, handset manufacturers and the carriers who had no software competence were squeezing that. You couldn't get those companies funded. Then came the iPhone, and suddenly the mobile consumer social internet, social media explodes in the scene. Now we're talking about smart transportation. Uh, you know, literally, we touched on this earlier, virtually every industrial or corporate is out hunting around here trying to figure out how they're going to be disrupted out of existence. Blockbuster doesn't exist. You can spend a dollar and buy a Redbox um, video for a day, but pretty much everybody collects things online. Um, my, my sense in the bubble is that it's relatively isolated, um, but it's really hard to shake because the stakes are so large. Uh, it's very easy to, you, c you really can fund companies until revenue with a million dollars today. And so those are small bets, and it's not any singular investor betting that much. It's typically a syndicate where somebody puts in a hundred grand and somebody else puts in seventy-five thousand, and you add it up, and it winds up being a million dollars. So there's not a lot individually at stake at each of these companies. Um, w what is at stake, though, is the billion-dollar valuations 
where com especially the companies have raised a billion dollars. That puts such a high bar on an exit. And Bonnie touched on some of the companies struggling in the public aftermarket. Um, my s suspicion is that the venture industry, which is kind of shrank in terms of you know the number of funds with tons of capital, as opposed to the expansion of the number of emerging managers, the first two years of funds that are, say, under $100 million, that the traditional funds have sunk a ton of money into these unicorns, and that they're, those companies are the ones that are either going to really make it or crash very heavily. And that's probably the bubble that you're hearing about most of, most of the times. I mean, that's what I hear when I talk to people. But as John said, uh, you know, right now the, the market's pretty disciplined. It's, there are very few IPOs, and they tend to be very strong companies. Uh, the M&A buyers are extremely price disciplined, and they're not overbuying in the market, in my opinion. And technology is a kind of a rolling wave. It's, it, if it, when I think about what could happen in the next 10 years, it's actually kind of frightening. <laughs> so thanks very much for joining us this morning. If you have any questions, I think you can reach each of us by email or just catch us in the hallways.